Welcome everyone uh, to our session on barriers to belonging uh, from an Indigenous perspective. My name is Krista Carr. I am the CEO of Inclusion Canada and a member of the Disability and Working Canada Steering Committee. Really pleased to be your moderator for today's session. And I have joining me today, um, Neil Belanger, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, but I want to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Wallistaque and Passamaquoddy people, and would invite you all to take a moment to acknowledge the territory that you are joining from today as well. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Neil Belanger. Neil has over 30 years experience within Canada's Indigenous and non-Indigenous disability and health sectors. But particularly for the past 10 years, Neil has been the Executive Director of the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, lovingly known by many of us as BCANDS, B-C-A-N-D-S, an Indigenous disability organization holding special consultative status with the UN. Neil is also the CEO of a newly created national organization called Indigenous Disability Canada. BCANS provides a, a variety of programs and services relating to Indigenous disability across Canada, and their work has been highlighted through numerous provincial, national, and international awards and recognitions. The most recent being the Zero Project International Award presented to the Society in Vienna, Austria in 2019. In addition to his work with both Indigenous Disability Canada and BCANS, Neil serves in a variety of disability-related advisory roles. So Neil's gonna talk a little bit to us today about some of the barriers to belonging, particularly when it comes to Indigenous people uh, in the workplace and beyond. And when Neil's done, we're gonna open it up for a Q&A and I'll moderate that. And so you can feel free to start populating the Q&A function with your, with your questions. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, um, Krista, for that dated introduction. Where'd you get that from? 1922 or 2017? What is that? Anyways, um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Krista said, my name is Neil Belanger, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Indigenous Disability Canada and BCANS. Um, I'm calling in today from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees people, and I'd like to recognize the territories that each of you are on today. Um, I'm also a member of the Laxale clan in the House of Nigadane of the Gitsan First Nation, and as Krista says, I've been working in health and disability for the last uh, over 30 years. Um, and so before I get started, I'll give you a little background about the, the organization I work for here, uh, Indigenous Disability Canada, the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. So as Krista noted, we're a national Indigenous disability organization. We've been around for just over 31 years. Uh, 2022 marks our, our, our 31st year. And we provide a variety of services directly to individuals and family, um, Indigenous persons living with disabilities, both within First Nation and non-First Nations communities. So some of the programs that we run are uh, Indigenous Disability Case Management Program, where we connect people and families to resources. We uh, help out with applications for uh, different programs and services. We work within housing, healthcare. So basically, if you're an Indigenous person with a disability and you need assistance in accessing some services, you can come to us and our case managers will, will assist you in that. We also have the Indigenous uh, Disability or uh, Indigenous RDSP Savings Plan Program, where not unlike the case management program, we work with eligible individuals, uh, eligible meaning that they uh, have their disability tax credit to help them uh, open up a registered disability savings plan, which is one of the federal government's more progressive programs that they've introduced over the years. Uh, we've been quite successful there. We started that program in 2016, and I think that... Uh, uh, we've 
probably opened up probably around $15 million worth of uh, RDSPs, but if families and individuals could contribute to the maximum, it'd be around $40 million. So that's that's quite impressive. It's a very good program. We also adjudicate uh, persons with disabilities uh, uh, benefit applications here in BC on behalf of the federal government for BC's uh, 203 First Nations. We have provincial Jordan's principal um, program working again uh, with el eligible individuals and families, both residing within First Nations, non-First Nations communities. Uh, we have our support from Indigenous Student Learning Program, where we're giving out uh, a couple of million dollars worth of computers to eligible Indigenous students. Uh, we do a lot of research on accessibility. And uh, Neil, sorry. Neil, I'm, I've had a request for you to slow down a little bit for our captioners and interpreters. So I'm just going <laughs> to no, try to get it. you to not slow down. <laughs> sorry about that. Anyways, that's enough about uh, our organization. We also work heavily with the CRPD Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, we work with uh, with a number of organizations in relation to medical assistance dying, you know, which is appropriate because we're talking about barriers to inclusion today, and a, a, a number of other research projects with universities, both nationally and internationally, focusing on disability and inclusion. So I'm very pleased to be able to be here today, even though I'm a fast talker, um, yeah, with all of you to talk about some of the barriers that that um, uh, individuals and families that we serve experience um, day to day with an employment uh, uh, across the whole gamut of, of, of living within Canada. So. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work here for years. I, I've worked within uh, Indigenous health, uh, non-Indigenous health, uh, Indigenous disability, uh, within employment for disability as well. So I, I, I come with a, a lot of experience, not necessarily a lot of knowledge. Uh, I'm always learning, but but we see a lot of barriers out there that uh, that affect you know Indigenous and non-Indigenous people uh, living with disabilities. But I think. If we talk about Canada today, uh, whether we're talking about employment or or housing or um, just generally being treated as, as an Indigenous person with a disability, uh, the, over, the overwhelming barrier, and we've seen this recently again, is um, anti-Indigenous racism and discrimination. And, uh, and unfortunately, although provincial and federal governments have tried to implement measures to to address this on some level uh typically they're more reactionary than than uh, than uh, progressive in planning um as you all may be aware in winnipeg recently they've identified uh, arrested a man uh, a serial killer who's murdered four young indigenous women um, and unfortunately, our history and our current history is, is replete with this. And we see it in the case of uh, Keegan Combs here in British Columbia, a uh, young Indigenous man uh, living with a developmental uh, uh, disability who was basically left to perish while in care of the hospital because they didn't take his concerns legitimately. Um, um, we, we know Joyce Echuan um, down east who in Quebec, who was taunted by healthcare workers uh, and again uh, left to die in the healthcare system that was there to protect. Um, you know, and, and, and this is what we deal with every day. We see people being arrested when they try to open up a bank account at, uh, you know, with their granddaughter because people are unfamiliar with uh, status cards or identification pertaining to Indigenous people. And the reaction is always extreme. It's never, I mean, and I shouldn't say always, but it's very seldom understanding and in a, in a, in a position where people want to learn. So we see that and we see it across all systems. It's not just with healthcare. It's not just within banking. It's not just, you know, wherever. It's everywhere. It permeates throughout all of our societies and different organizations, government, non-government. Um, and it creates a huge barrier for people, for Indigenous people with disabilities wanting to access services. And the result is that they don't access those services. So their conditions can, can be amplified, their health, disability conditions, their employment status, their housing. You know, if you feel that you cannot get proper support, you can't get respect, or you're going to be disrespected when you try to access these services, why would you go? And we deal with that all the time. Um, 
Systemic poverty is another barrier. Um, 2016, the government uh, stats can released a report uh, noting that 80% of First Nations in Canada have a medium income under the poverty line. There are 634 First Nations in Canada. There are 53 Inuit communities and numerous Métis chartered territories. Um, we have a population of about 1.8 million who identify as being Indigenous. And the disability rate for Indigenous people is probably around 35%, so significantly higher than that of the general population. And again, there's a number of reasons for that, poverty being run, access to, to, uh, to food, uh, nutritious foods, uh, uh, inaccessible communities, some of the traditional um, activities of communities out on the land as well. So we have a number of, of, uh, of um, things that impact the higher rate of disabilities. Um, but inclusion, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I could go on for a long time talking about different things here. Uh, but realistically, if we talk about inclusion, we talk about about uh, anti indigenous discrimination and racism, we talk about attitudes towards indigenous people, there's still that myth out there that all indigenous people, they get all their housing for free, you know, they don't have to work if they want to, they can all go to school, all those things that I'm sure typically a lot of people here on this call have heard, but are simply untrue. But yet, that's the, that's the, the mindset that they have to work within these systems. We also have provincial and federal uh, and uh, territorial jurisdiction issues as well. So when we work with an individual or a family, we have to do fairly comprehensive uh, background uh, gathering and information on them to, about their Indigenous ancestry, where they live, you know, where their nation is. And that can often dictate what kind of programs and services they're eligible for, because they do difference between federal and provincial jurisdictions. Um, so that adds extra extra uh, time and and uh, stress onto the individual as well. Um, and again, when we talk about uh, government positions such as medical assistance in dying, so we're quite active on that file with Inclusion Canada and other partners as well, looking at the slippery slope or the expansion of medical assistance in dying in Canada. Um, just recently, we we saw two expert panel reports on on mature minors and mental illness as a sole condition. In both those reports, they highlight that there's been no consultation or engagement with Indigenous communities in Canada. So what we have is law that is being put forward and being changed to expand eligibility for MAID without talking to one of the most vulnerable population made vulnerable by the systems that we have in Canada, Indigenous people with disabilities. Um, this is particularly true in the, in the instance of mental health, for example, when you have people living in northern or remote communities, when trying to get access to mental health services is almost next to impossible in a timely manner, where people have been waiting years for, for services that aren't delivered. But now we see that the government um, and governments are advancing this, making eligibility more open even though you cannot get services to live a good life. And we can apply that to many, many things as well. So if we look at communities as well, the inaccessibility, uh, inaccessible communities here, we know that um, or many of you may be aware of the Accessible Canada Act, which was put into law in 2019, you know, under the federal, uh, you know, governing federally regulated entities such as banks and airports and First Nations. However, First Nations were exempted from that for five years. So they are not, they do not fall under the Accessible Canada Act while the government tries to take a look and see because there's a cost factor there. So we have many inaccessible communities, many communities that don't have running water that uh, don't have roads, uh, paved roads, don't have sidewalks. Some of their buildings are two-story with no elevators. So, so the barriers for being included in their own community because planning wasn't done properly or, 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 or the need wasn't there at the time, whatever the case may be, uh, becomes problematic as well. So if you can't get a job within your own community because you might use a wheelchair and the only position available is in a building that's totally inaccessible, I mean, these create other issues as well. But Canada exempted First Nations under the Accessible Canada Act, um, saying that, uh, you know, in the spirit of UNRWA, uh, the UN uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and lack of consultation. So we have, which is which is kind of a uh, interesting situation where we have uh, uh, the Accessible Canada Act, which would cost money to implement changes to make sure communities, First Nations communities are all accessible, it would cost billions of dollars. Uh, 
we now exempt uh, First Nations from that, saying that there wasn't proper proper consultation. Where we have made medical assistance in dying, which actually saves provincial and federal governments money, and and they they acknowledge that they haven't done any consultation with uh, Indigenous people across Canada, but they're going to move forward. So we see, on one hand, where there's where 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 investment in, in funding and support is necessary to make Canada truly inclusive. We've exempted First Nations, but on the other hand, where there's cost savings that could come in and we've done no consultation with Indigenous people, we further go forward and, and keep moving forward that way. And that seems to be the trend often when we're talking about changes to Indigenous uh, systems that affect Indigenous people, Indigenous persons living with disabilities specifically, that often were brought into after decisions have made to consult on policy changes and recommendations and how do we move forward from decisions that have always been made for, for our clients and our communities. Um, and that's problematic. Too often, we're not at the table. Too often, persons with disabilities, Indigenous persons with disabilities are not involved in the process. Um, but then, you know, something comes forward. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had meetings with governments where they've brought me great ideas after the fact, after they've developed them, um, which didn't make any sense whatsoever. And whether you're in Ottawa or in Winnipeg or in, in Vancouver or, or in Halifax, you know, these ideas may look good in that office and they may, may make sense to the person developing these things and say, in a perfect world, this is how things will work. Um, but it doesn't always translate to our communities and we do, we do not live in a perfect world. And until we do something as a country to address uh, anti-Indigenous racism and discrimination, discrimination against persons with disabilities. I don't think that we can really go forward, and I don't think that we'll be a truly inclusive country. Uh, when we look at the employment side here, yeah, we 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 um, we often see people that we work with that we that we may assist going to school or or getting employment come back to us and say. You know, I can't go there. Uh, you know, the comments by employees or by 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 other staff members, even management, uh, are unbearable because often we have clients that are, that may not present um, uh, visually as being indigenous, but are full status or are Métis. And people, when they when they often don't realize that they may be standing with somebody who is indigenous or someone who has uh, an invisible disability, they feel more free to talk, and they'll talk about this, and they'll talk about their feelings, they'll talk about, you know, the drain on the systems by persons with disabilities, by Indigenous people, by Indigenous people with disabilities. This creates a hostile work environment. It doesn't make it uh, conducive for everybody to want to go back there. Uh, it doesn't make it conducive to make a career of these things. So we need those things in place, and not in a reactionary way that when all of a sudden something hits a newspaper that we're going to all of a sudden have a national meeting and talk about the things. We need to start doing things now on an ongoing basis to address discrimination racism, you know, to address, um, you know, violence against uh, women with disabilities, Indigenous with women with disabilities, all those things that we know are prevalent, and they've been prevalent for a long time. But as a country, we haven't done really anything to do this, do anything to change it. We also need to be curious as, as individuals, as service providers, and as governments to know who people are who Indigenous people are in their community, in the urban centers, and be part of a bigger picture. And not only, again, during time of crisis, because that never works, uh, but to be part of their community ongoing and to go in there and not with saying, well, how, how can I fix you? But saying, I want to learn. I want to learn about you. I want you to help me better understand and be a part of that community. And we don't see that often enough. We see it sporadically. Uh, we see many, many organizations and service providers that are reluctant to they're reluctant to offend they're afraid to engage they don't know how to engage and because of all these factors they don't engage and then nothing moves forward and then you know some, some organizations some people don't think it's within their mandate um, but it's not if we are a community here and we're trying to build a more inclusive canada for everybody then it's in everybody's mandates um uh anti-indigenous racism discrimination is everybody's priority uh you know all the things that we see happening in Canada today, it can't be handled by a few organizations or a few people. It has to be handled by us all. And until we get to that point, we'll always have barriers. We'll have topics like this come up at, at different events as well. And we'll talk about how we can do things differently in the future. And unfortunately, I know that because many of the conversations that I have today, I've had 20 years ago and we haven't progressed from them. You know, we haven't moved forward from them. 
So as we do move forward, though, uh, you know, when we talk about Indigenous people and persons with disabilities, we really have to make sure that they're involved in the process and they help design the systems that we want them to live in. Um, because if we don't do that, it's never going to work out. It's never going to happen. Um, and again, like I said, I, I, I don't know how many meetings I've been involved with that, that I've talked about, um, you know, back in the 80s, you know, and, and the same situations and the same things and, and the same solutions just written differently. Uh, I remember here when I first started here, we started going through some old documents that we had. There was a report by whatever the ministry was called back then saying by 2020, every person living with a disability within British Columbia will have a job. And those are great aspirational things. They're just not realistic. Many people can't work. Uh, many people can work uh, uh, sporadically depending upon their needs and their disability. And there's never been a concerted effort to actually make that happen other than it looks good on paper. So, you know, there's multiple barriers that I haven't covered as well. I mean, just tons of them that, that we experience in our everyday work here. And I know that other service providers experience as well. But we haven't really done anything to combat them. Like I said, we're we're, we're more reactive than proactive, and and uh, we got to change that. Thanks a lot, Neil. Now I see that somebody did ask, "Are your services just in BC?" So maybe you could talk just to start by a little bit about uh, you know Indigenous Disability Canada versus BCANS and how that. So we run, yeah, thanks, Krista. We, we run uh, programs both nationally and in BC. So most of our direct service programs are based in BC. So our Indigenous Disability Case Management, our Indigenous RDSP program, uh, our, our Persons with Disability Benefit Adjudication, our Jordan's Principal uh, are all based in BC, but we're in the process of expanding those across uh, Canada and to other provinces and territories. That being said, we work with individuals across Canada uh, because we know that resources are limited. So often we'll get a call from Ontario or from PEI or from Saskatchewan, uh, you know, someone who is in dire straits, someone who needs assistance. And as a service provider, uh, regardless of where our services are, we don't think it's on us to say, well, don't call us because then we would be part of the problem. We would be part of that barrier to inclusion. So we'll work with people and we'll do as much as we can. It helps us as an organization as well to show that there is a need not only in BC, but across Canada and, and also let the person know that they're important. One of the big things is with any service that we provide, whether it's national like the computer program or our research program or the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, is that every intervention that we can do with an individual and family shows that somebody cares. And it shows that somebody is trying to do something for them. And the worst thing that can ever happen to an individual is knowing that nobody cares or nobody seems to care or they don't seem to be fitting into anybody's mandate. I can't tell you how many times we have people that have, that have come to us uh, in desperation and, and we've helped them out and they've said, you're the first organization that's ever taken us seriously in 10 years. And that happens all the time. And disability, Indigenous disability, is not a high priority in Canada, even within our own communities, and largely because there's so many other priorities that haven't been addressed. So if we talk about the poverty, we talk about inaccessibility, we talk about anti-Indigenous racism, all those things that, you know, leadership within communities and the community itself have to deal with, you know, disability often falls to the to the lowest rung of the ladder. And that's, and that's not right. You know, uh, we see even um, when when uh, Indigenous people go and, and they go to university or school or higher education, whatever the case may be, they're often considered not to be at par as non-Indigenous people, that somehow their education is less than that of non-Indigenous people. And we see that throughout government systems and other organizations. And I have many colleagues I spoke to and said, you know, we're just disrespected just because we're Indigenous. We're not considered to be equal because that somehow our education might even be the same university is somehow less than 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 someone who is non-Indigenous. Excuse me for a second. No, we have that too. But the question is, it depends on what you're asking for. Some programs are national, some are more localized, but uh, we'll help when we can. And, um, and, and, and we have an amazing team here. It has nothing to do with me because if they were like me, they wouldn't be as good as they are. Crystal will vouch for that. Um, we have good people and, and we hire people here that want to make a difference in the lives of people. 
um, not because it's ethically the right thing to do. It's because who they are as people, as individuals. So when I leave and I have to go to meetings, I do other things like that. I have no hesitation to worry that the people that we serve are coming will not be treated well, will not be served well. We haven't always hired the best people, you know, but they never last because we move them along because they're not conducive to the work that we do and we're not conducive to the people that we serve. So, uh, you know, Beacons is a good organization and it's made up by the people that are good people. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done across Canada for Indigenous people with disabilities. You know, um, we need more people like we have here. Uh, we're working towards that, but yeah, we continue.